And Jesus is saying to you that you are welcome at his table. And, and even though this sermon is not really about that, our logo, our motto is not just something catchy that I came up with, loving God, loving each other, loving the world. It's who we are. It's who we seek to be. It's who God has us in partnership with as we are walking this journey with him. Our scripture this morning is found in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 31. Now, some of y'all are going, wait, how did you get to 1 Corinthians from Malachi? Okay. I came here this morning jonesing to hear a lesson or a sermon on you have robbed God. Okay. I had an inkling what this morning was all about, and, and the Lord just said, that's not the message you need to preach this morning. So it will wait until next Sunday. Uh, Memorial Day, that's a, that would be a good message for Memorial Day, won't it? <laughs> so we're, we're going to look at this message that kind of fits in with exactly why we're here this morning. Listen to me. We're not just here celebrating Angie and I's ministry at Concord for 30 years. As you celebrate us, you celebrate yourself. Because you're part of that ministry, okay? We can't do it all. We can't do it all. And that's what Paul is saying in our text this morning. So if you will, let's stand and honor the reading of God's Word. And let's read 1 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 12 through the end of the chapter. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit, by one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. We're going to lock in on that in just a few minutes, but I want you to hear what God just said to you. We'll read it again. God has placed the members. That's you. That's me. Each one of us in the body just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, and our less presentable members become much more presentable. Whereas our more presentable members have no need of it, but God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, you are Christ's body and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the greater gifts. And I show you a still more excellent way. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the reading of your perfect and infallible word in our midst this morning. And God, as you illumined the heart and mind of Paul when you gave to him this perfect and infallible word, Lord, we just ask that you would illumine us this morning as well. And God, that you would show us that still more excellent way. We love you so much, Lord. And we offer to you our love, 
our lives in this prayer, in and through the name of our risen Lord and Master, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. You may be seated. You know, I understand that I'm kind of from a different generation. All right, I, I'm old enough to remember when a person would, would get out of school, uh, either they graduate from high school or they'd go on and go to college. They would then take a job. They would work there their entire career and retire, and they'd give you a gold watch. That doesn't seem like a fair deal to me. But, you know, anyway. And, and I understand. I mean, you know, uh, again, I'm odd. I, I don't, there's only one or two people at, at the school system that have worked at the school system longer than I have. And, and so it's kind of unusual. Well, how do we get there? I mean, how do you get to the place where you're accomplishing things? And how do we get to the place where we recognize that we're part of the body? You know, one of the things that, that I've learned over, over the years is that I've had to learn to let other people exercise their gifts. Okay? There may be times when, like, we're going out on visitation that I feel like, okay, that, that might be, you know, I got this. I, I, I know how to do visitation. But I've got other people with me, and, and so I just kind of let them take the lead. Let them take the lead. And while they're talking to the person we're visiting, then I'm praying. Okay? I'm praying for them as they're sharing the gospel. And, and, and letting others exercise the gifts. Now, we're not going to talk about the gifts this morning, okay? I mean, Paul listed them. This is one of the list, lists of gifts that Paul gives. There's four lists that he gives, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Titus 4, and 1 Timothy 4. That's where they're all listed, okay? And you can look and see. Uh, on our old website, we used to have the Elmertown Spiritual Gift Survey. I don't think we have it on there anymore. Just remember Elmer, Elmertown's Spiritual Gifts Survey. And you can look that up. You can Google that if you're not clear what your spiritual gifts are. And you can come and talk to me about that. Uh, as Lou has been reading through 1 Corinthians for us during Sunday school time... He's really been ministering God's word to me from, from this epistle. And, and as I began, once God had me convinced, and y'all got to know I argued with God over, have you robbed God this morning, right? You know, when he said, you can't preach that Sunday morning, I went, well, of course I can, Lord. And he, he said, well, you can, but I ain't going to show up, <laughs> okay? And I said, well, Lord, then I don't want to do it. What would you have me preach? And he just kept drawing me to this notion that we're one body. That you're not here by accident. You're not here because, you know, of anything on earth. You are here, verse 18 said, because this is where God has placed you. He brought you here. He, he puts you within this body of believers. And, and listen to me. If you are within this body of believers, you have a ministry within this body of believers. There may be a gift that you have that none of us have. Okay? There may be something that God has specifically and uniquely gifted you for that none of us have. And we can just stand back and go, look at what God's doing in this person's life. See, I believe... And I've told all of y'all this. I believe that the church should be a permission-giving network. That when someone comes to me and says, God has given me a burden, God has, has given me this, this idea, we want to do this, we want to do that, then my role is not to say no. My role is to say, wow, that's amazing. What do you need from us to do that? Okay. What do you need from this body of believers that you can take this thing that God has given to you and bring honor and glory to Him? That's what the church is all about. And so we've worked very hard 
over the last 30 years to make this church a church like that, that it is a permission giving network that no one ever has to be afraid to come to the pastor with an idea no matter how far out there it might might sound at the time and you know in 30 years I've, i've never heard this church say no when we brought it to the business meeting and said here's what we believe god wants us to do not one time has the church said no And so God has done a great work in in our lives, and he wants to continue to do a great work in our lives. But here's the rub. Some of y'all this morning may have the enemy whispering in your ears. And he may be saying to you, you know, when he said that every Christian has a gift, not you. You don't have one. That's what the enemy wants you to believe. He wants you to believe that God has not given to you a gift to be used for the glorification of God and His kingdom. Now what Miss Rebecca just shared with us a few moments ago, we all know that that's from Galatians 5. And those are the fruits of the Spirit. Those are the things that come out in our lives as the Holy Spirit gets more and more control over our lives. And as we step back and say, Lord, I don't understand how this gift works, but you do. You placed me where I am as you desire. And so, Lord, you've got something going on, and I'm going to let you do it. I'm just going to get out of the way and let you do it. In verses 12 and 13, Paul introduces this thing. We understand that. And he uses this kind of uh, silly metaphor. He wants you to get this silly picture in your mind, and we'll look at it in a moment. But we all understand that, that in our human body, that we all, I mean, right? We have two hands, two feet, two legs, two arms. We have our fingers. If, if all of our fingers were thumbs, what would that look like? You know, if we were just a big cyclops, what would that look like? And Paul is saying, even as the body is one and yet has many members, all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. What he is telling us, beloved, is that we are connected. Okay? We got people in this room that were originally born in places all over this country. Okay? All over this country. I mean, we can go from the very uh, far northeast to the very far southeast. We can go at least halfway across the country, and we can go all the way across the state with me. And yet we're connected. Listen, we're not connected by the language that we speak. We're not connected by the color of our skin. We're not connected by the accent that we speak with. We are connected by the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is saying that we are one body and have many members, that he is bringing us in to this fellowship just as he promised, and he is making us into a one body, so we are one essentially and fundamentally. And so verse 13 tells us that we are one with one another because we are one with Jesus. Does that make sense? We are one with one another because we are one with Jesus. Earlier in this letter, Paul had made reference to the ordinances. Okay? We understand the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And, of course, some fellowships practice foot washing as an ordinance as well. But Paul, the point that he makes with that, is that the supernatural things that we are doing are what those ordinances point us to. 
Water baptism is the outward sign of an inward change. Okay? You understand what we're saying? You, I mean, you get the Romans Road, right? We, we all have the Romans Road in our mind. If you don't, concordbc.org slash mission trip. Okay? Great presentation. I, I'm not bragging, but it's a good presentation on how to use the Romans Road in, in, in your witnessing efforts. Also, there's a, a one in there on using just John 3.16. Okay? But the point is, is that Paul begins, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. You sin, you die. It's a one-to-one correlation. Okay, it's a one-to-one correlation in the Bible. You sin, you die. That's not a new policy. It goes all the way back to the garden. God said, you eat from that tree, you die. Okay? But very often, that's where we stop. But Paul goes on to say the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That is saying that something amazing and supernatural has taken place in the life of a believer. That the Lord Jesus Christ has come in, that the individual has been converted, they have been translated from the kingdom of sin and death to the kingdom of righteousness and eternal life. And that's what water baptism points to. Now, there are some that will teach you that there is a second baptism that is necessary. That there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit and it is completely and wholly apart and distinct from water baptism. That's not what Paul teaches at all. Now, generally those that that teach that are locked in on what Paul is specifically teaching against in this section of 1 Corinthians. Okay? Because they will say that for you to give evidence that you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you must speak in tongues. You show me any verse that you have not ripped completely out of context that says that that's what it means. Paul is saying that to be a Christian at all means to me infinitely, profoundly connected by the Holy Spirit to Jesus Christ himself. Every single Christian, regardless of ethnicity or class or social status, is one in him. And so Paul is calling us to begin to be who we really are who we really are, by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks or slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. Do you understand that there is no place in the body of Christ for white supremacy? None. There is no place in the body of Christ for supremacy of anything other than the message of the gospel. Because the gospel triumphs over everything. I am not a better Christian because I'm a white American Christian. Okay? I am not a better Baptist because I'm a white Southern Baptist. I am who I am because Jesus Christ lives in me. And this is where he called me to be. I have been baptized into one body. The Holy Spirit immerses us into the death of Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? That's what we're showing. That's, listen to me. That's why, other than some, some linguistic things that we could talk about in the Greek word baptizo, but that's why we do full immersion is because we are showing that the Holy Spirit has has baptized us into the death of Jesus and that we are buried in the likeness. And so the entire body is taken under the baptismal waters. Fun fact, and then I'll bring it in for landing. My first baptism. You know, you're always nervous about your first, right? As a pastor, okay, you're always nervous about your first wedding, first you know, first time somebody responds to an invitation, first baptism, 
first funeral. Okay, and so we had a lady that used to live in, in the trailer that, that Jackie lived in. Y'all, y'all know where I'm talking about? Okay. That double wide right across from Mike that they're putting together right now. Uh, she lived right there. She had a little girl that was about four years old. And, and she came. We'd been doing some visiting. We'd, we'd talk to her. She made a profession of faith, had come, and, we, and, and wanted to be baptized. Okay. It was summer, and so I said, where do you want to be baptized? And, and she said, what do you mean? I said, well, we've got a baptistry, but we also will baptize you in the river. And she said, oh, I want to be baptized in the river. And so the Douthats own some property down on the river, okay, uh, off of Fish Hatchery, and they let us come down there. Well, as you know, the, when we came here, it was like God was giving me an example of what it looked like in Noah's day because it, like, rained for 40 days and 40 nights, okay? I mean, it was... There were two ways in and out of this community, Flea Ridge and, and Philippi Road. Okay, that was it. Those are the only ways in and out. Okay. And so you can imagine that when I stepped out into the river, she was a flowing swift. Okay. And, and I got out about knee high, and I wasn't comfortable going any further out because it was even faster out there. And this lady outweighed me by a little bit. Okay. And, and so she came out there, and when she came out, I, I leaned down and whispered in her ear, when I take you down, squat, okay, so that I can get you completely underneath the water. And she had a little, uh, the, like I said, she had a little daughter, and Pat and Ray Sizemore were in, involved in this uh, uh, lady's life, and so Pat was taking care of the baby. And when I took Mama underneath the water, oh, that flew all over that little girl because she thought I was trying to hurt Mommy, okay. And she started crying and screaming and, and all of that. I told you that just to give you a respite. Uh, But the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the death of Christ, but He doesn't leave us there, amen? The Holy Spirit baptizes us into the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so God, listen to me, God can look at you and say you have already died and been resurrected. You don't have to wait until you die to begin living resurrection life. You can start living it now. This point will change your life. All genuine believers owe their very existence to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then in verses 14 through 20, Paul deals with with how we very often think about ourselves. Okay, And, and again, he wants to use this humorous example. Can you imagine if you walked into the room this morning? Because you're the feet. And all that was in the room was a great big eye. Well, as the feet, you wouldn't know because you don't have an eye. Okay? And if you're an eye, you'd see the feet, but you couldn't do anything about it. If you wanted to go over and fellowship with them, you'd have to kind of roll over there. And if you're the ears, you heard something, but you can't tell anybody about it. And if you're the mouth, and some of you are going, I know which one's the mouth. Then you can't hear, you can't see, you can't, you know, all you can do is talk. And Paul is saying that the body of Christ works the exact same way our human body works. That we have to have all of these varying gifts. That all of us have to be doing these things. And then again in verse 18, I really want to concentrate on this, and and then we'll stop. Now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. Again, you are here for a reason. You are here because you and you alone have a gift that God has determined this body of believers needs. Or that God wants, it's not really a good way to put it, but that God wants to exercise your gift out through this body of believers. And then Paul writes to verse 21, or writes in verses 21 and 26 and says, Listen, my papa used to say, Don't get too big for your britches. Y'all know what that means? Don't get too big for your britches. Okay, just because I have the gift of, of, of being a pastor. That doesn't mean that I'm better than the chairman of my deacons. It doesn't mean that I'm better than the person that cleans the church. It doesn't mean that I'm better than the person that takes care of the books for us. 
I'm not better than the person that, that does any of the things that has any other gift within this body of believers. This is just the gift that God has given to me as He's given to you a gift. And, and He needs both of us exercising our gifts together. Y'all know what? Remember uh, the car I used to have, that, that, that gold sable? Okay. Well, toward the end of its ministry to me, Cylinder number one would misfire a lot, and sometimes it just wouldn't work. If you've ever driven a car that wasn't firing on all cylinders, okay, you know what I'm talking about. It's a rough and bumpy ride. It does bring you closer to Jesus because you're praying the whole time you're driving, okay? Lord, please let me get where I'm going, okay? But you also know that that car was designed to fire on all cylinders. This body of believers was designed to fire on all cylinders. And we need you to be a part of that. Verse 31 and we're done. How do you do it? Earnestly desire the greater gifts. Listen, it's not a sin. It's not bad for you to say, God, would you give to me this particular gift? God might say yes. He might say no. But it's not a sin to ask for a particular spiritual gift. And I show you a still more excellent way. Now, you know what that still more excellent way because you know what's coming up next. Romans chapter 13, the love chapter. Let me ask you a question. What if you went to Walmart this afternoon and you walked into the store and all of the shelves were filled with these beautifully decorated boxes and you picked up that box and you went, well, this feels kind of light. And you opened it up and there was nothing inside. That's what a Christian without love is. It's a beautifully wrapped up box but there's nothing inside that's useful. And so, beloved, Paul in the next chapter is going to tell us how to live our lives, how to live out our ministry, and to be the people that he has called us to be. So will we be filled with the more excellent way?